Dead America, El Paso, Part 4. Dead America, The Third Week, Book 1. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by P.J. Morgan. Chapter 1. Day 0 plus 15. Here you go, boys. Got a fresh pot going for you, Ethel said, setting down two steaming hot mugs between the two men at the window. Leon grabbed his immediately and took a deep inhale, smelling the liquid gold and offering the older woman a warm smile. Ethel, you treat us too well. Yeah, gonna have to be careful, Rogers added with a twinkle in his eye. Don't want this one getting spoiled. She reached out and squeezed each of them on the shoulder. Oh, it's my pleasure, boys, she assured them. Although it might be in your best interest to keep an eye out for something nice while you're running errands, I do have a birthday coming up after all. She gave them a conspiratorial wink and headed back over to her desk. I'll make sure to add that into the search parameters, Leon said before taking another sip. Don't want to upset the flow of coffee. Rogers raised his mug. Cheers to that. They clinked and sipped and turned back to the window. They knew the cartel would inevitably come back, but at least the case of booze they'd found had lessened the knots of stress in their shoulders a little. How's the situation in the high school going? Rogers asked. Leon nodded. Good. I talked to Kevin last night for a long while, while I was waiting for the satellite to come over. Everybody is safe and in good spirits, just anxious to get out of there. I can imagine, Rogers replied. That has to suck to be cooped up in one building for weeks on end. Did he ever let slip how he was able to get them in there? As soon as I identified myself as a detective, he kind of clammed up like he was gonna get in trouble or something. His companion shrugged. Yeah, he was the janitor at the school, so he had the keys to the place, he said. As soon as that first zombie encounter happened, he grabbed his family and neighbors and hightailed it up to the school. They locked it up tight and rode it out. Good on him, the detective commended, hooking up one ankle on top of his opposite knee. Although it doesn't sound very encouraging on the manpower front, I don't have anything against families, but we are kind of desperate for able-bodied adults, not kids. Leon shrugged. Kevin said there's four of them in there that can really help out with the fighting. Speaking of that, when is your New Mexico crew coming in? Rogers asked. His friend took a sip of his brew before replying. Talked to them last night. They're here, but I told them to hang in the outskirts until they see the cartel leave. Doesn't throw off our timeline any, and to be frank, the cartel doesn't need to know about them. Amen to that, the detective agreed. Gonna be good to see them again. Leon mused. Rogers raised an eyebrow. Y'all go way back? Nah, I really only saw them twice, his friend admitted with a chuckle. We were sitting around drinking and bullshitting one night after I got there, swapping old war horror stories and whatnot. Then when the shit hit the fan, we all ended up in the supply room at the same time with the same goal of getting the fuck out of Dodge. Their CO came in and started laying into them, which is when I stepped up and claimed they were helping me with my mission. Since I outranked their CO, I waved him off and gave them the chance to get out. So they owe you one then, Rogers asked. Leon shook his head. Nah, we don't see it that way. Then why in the world are they willingly stepping into this shit show? The detective waved his hand in the vague direction of the window. His friend grinned. Because I told them they get the chance to assassinate a cartel leader, he said. Do you have any idea what kind of after-action headaches that would have caused before? Paperwork, debriefings, desk jockeys in D.C. criticizing every move we made. Now, we just kick back with a few beers and reminisce. I guess I understand that. Rogers agreed with a thoughtful nod. I remember how much paperwork I had to file when I shot a dude that pulled a piece on me, can't imagine what it would be like to take out someone as big as a cartel leader. Leon took a deep breath. Quite a bit more, I can assure you. So, you have some thoughts on how to take him down? The detective asked. El Guapo? Leon pursed his lips for a moment. Man, that's a tough one. I mean, the most logical solution is to snipe him, but that would require some complicated mechanics to get the shot lined up. Rogers cocked his head. 
Could always go the car bomb route. Yeah, oldie but a goodie, Leon agreed. Plus, who doesn't love a good explosion? The detective shook his head. Although we'd still have the same problems of getting him into the right place. We could always just head on down to Mexico and recruit a rival gang, Leon suggested. Rogers barked a laugh. Somehow I don't think the two of us would survive very long down in Mexico on that kind of mission. Might be longer than us trying to clear this town out with what we have at our disposal, his friend replied. The detective shot him a sly grin. You mean you haven't come up with a plan to clear it out yet? Hey, you're the idea, man, Leon shot back, holding up a hand. I'm just here to do the satellite surveillance and occasionally shoot something from afar. Rogers chuckled. So that's how it is, huh? Damn right, Leon agreed. They clinked mugs again and then sat up straight as two SUVs pulled into the parking lot outside of the command center. Looks like you're up. Rogers leaned down and grabbed the high-end bottle of tequila, holding it out. Leon took it and rolled his eyes. As always, thank you for making me the face of this town, he said, sarcasm evident in his tone. I just can't start my morning without dealing with these pricks. The detective raised his mug and grinned. My pleasure, big fella. Leon shook his head and headed outside, securing the door behind him. As he approached the vehicles, a handful of guards got out, followed by Angel Rivas and his father's right-hand man, Rodriguez. Angel clasped his hands in front of him, chin raised, a smug smile on his face. Rodriguez, Leon greeted, and then inclined his head to Angel. Boy. The younger Rivas sneered. You are fortunate that you have found a brand my father adores, he said or else I would cut out your tongue for your insult. Thanks for confirming that you are indeed a daddy's boy, Leon replied. Angel whipped out a butterfly knife, taking a step forward. Maybe my father will forgive me if I teach you a lesson. Leon immediately grabbed the kid's wrist, twisting it just enough so that the blade pointed outward away from him. Angel twisted his arm, but couldn't break free of the man's iron grip. You come at me again, and I'm gonna make you call me daddy, Leon growled. Rodriguez stepped forward. Enough, he demanded. Leon loosened his grip, just enough for Angel to wrench his arm free, and the kid pointed the blade in his face like a finger. Soon, soon. I said enough, Angel, Rodriguez barked. The kid sneered again before putting his knife away, and then snatched the bottle of tequila before storming off to his vehicle. We're done here, he called to his guards. Let's go drink while they do the work. There were a few whoops and hollers as the men got into the SUV, and Rodriguez got up in Leon's face. Oh, you've done it now, Angel taunted. You need to be careful with Angel, Rodriguez said quietly through gritted teeth. I won't always be able to keep him on the leash. Leon kept his expression angry. We need to talk, he whispered. I will get here when I can, Rodriguez breathed back. Soon, or we may have to move without you, Leon murmured. Rodriguez looked both concerned and intrigued, but schooled his expression before he headed back to the vehicles. Leon stared as the caravan peeled out of the driveway, chewing his bottom lip and hoping that the urgency of his request was taken seriously. Chapter Two. As soon as the vehicles disappeared into the interstate, Leon held up a hand with a thumbs up. Rogers exited the command center, heading towards him, and Trenton, Clara, and Reed approached from a neighboring building. Glad that was a short visit, Trenton declared. Leon nodded, clapping him on the shoulder. You and me both, man. Were you able to deliver the message? Rogers asked. Yeah, Rodriguez knows we're on the clock, Leon replied with a nod. He'll show. Reed took a deep breath. So, what now? Leon pointed down the road to a single SUV headed their way. Well, that was quick. Clara blinked at the vehicle. Looks like Rodriguez took your request seriously. Leon shook his head. That's not Rodriguez. 
Then who is it? She asked. Rogers grinned. Trouble. Leon nodded. The good kind. As the vehicle grew closer, it was clear that it held some damage. There were bullet holes here and there, with the front bumper completely gone. One of the doors looked like it was duct taped shut. As it stopped in front of them, the engine gave a death rattle as it shut off. The doors opened, but the duct taped door exploded out, kicked clean off by Private Landry as he bounded out into the sun like a puppy breaking free of a crate. Finally, thank fucking Christ, he declared, running his hands through his blonde hair and extending his arms to the sky. Private Whitaker wrinkled her nose as she skirted around the vehicle. It was no picnic being in there with you either, bud. Private Mathis shook his head, his chocolate skin shining with a thin sheet of sweat. Hey, at least you got to be in the front seat. Your window being down kept his stench firmly back there with me. Did you just call me Smelly? Landry demanded. Smelly doesn't do it justice, Mathis shot back. It would take someone with a PhD in English to devise a word to properly describe whatever the fuck is coming out of your body. Sergeant Hammond got out of the driver's seat and approached Leon, shaking his head all the while at his team. Leon raised an eyebrow. Long trip, Sergeant? I honestly don't understand how there weren't a string of fathers murdering their entire families on road trips, Hammond replied. Or at the very least, driving head on into traffic. His friend chuckled. Well, you made it through, didn't you? Mainly because there wasn't any traffic to veer into, Hammond said, and they shared a laugh, shaking hands and smacking each other on the shoulder. Leon grinned. Man, it is good to see y'all again. You too, buddy. Hammond replied and looked around the town. Looks like you're doing all right for yourself. Although I seem to recall you saying that your plan was to say fuck civilization and go live off the land or some shit. Leon nodded. Yeah, the cartel had other ideas, so I ended up here with this ragtag bunch. He turned and motioned to his friends as he spoke. Allow me to introduce everyone. This is our lead scout, Trenton, his buddy Reed, the lovely but deadly Clara, and this salty old bastard here is Detective Rogers. Rogers reached out to shake the sergeant's hand. Pretty sure you can just call me Rogers now. Retired from the force? Hammond asked as they shook. Well, I haven't checked my bank account lately, but I'd venture a guess and assume they haven't paid me in a while, Rogers replied. Hammond cocked his head. Well, shit, I guess that means I'm not a sergeant anymore. Hell, if that's the standard, were you ever really a sergeant? Leon quipped. I've seen what they pay you guys. Hammond chuckled. Point taken. He motioned the members of his group as he introduced them. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you all. I'm Sergeant Hammond, the one who needs to be hosed down as Private Landry. His backseat mate is Private Mathis. He winked at Clara. And not to be outdone, we have our own lovely but deadly lady in Private Whitaker. Everyone murmured greetings, nodding and saying hello, as Rogers and Leon stepped over to the vehicle. So aside from the backseat bickering, it looks like you had a bit of a rough ride, Rogers said. Landry raised a hand. Shit, man, that's an understatement. Yeah, things were going smoothly until we hit the border and stopped to fill up, Whitaker added. Trenton crossed his arms. What happened? We had a run-in with the king of the gas station, Lantry replied. Some lone wolf prick who decided it was a good idea to keep the fuel to himself. You, you didn't kill him, did you? Reed asked, eyes wide. Whitaker waved her hands back and forth in front of her face. No, we're not cold-blooded murderers, she replied, and then wrinkled her nose. Well, at least to people who aren't 100% deserving of it. We let Mathis here negotiate for us, Landry said. Clara's brow furrowed. How did you manage that? Mathis reached into the back seat and pulled out his sniper rifle. I pierced his ear from 100 yards out, he declared proudly. After that, he was in a more sharing mood. Rogers fingered the bandage on his own ear. I can see how that would be a quality negotiating tactic. Damn, dude, Landry's jaw dropped. 
Who did you piss off? The detective sighed. Cartel? Well, don't worry, we're gonna help you get even with them. Landry held up a fist in solidarity. The sergeant leaned against the hood of the busted SUV. Speaking of which, you wanna fill us in on the assassination plan details, Leon? I'm afraid we have some business we have to attend to here in town first, Leon replied, and motioned over his shoulder to the command center. Why don't we go inside and I'll fill you in? Chapter three. The group crowded around Leon's computer desk, the man in question at the helm, as he brought up a map of the area. As he worked, Ethel headed in with a tray of fresh coffee for everyone, stopping at the scuffed up military group first. You look like you could use a cup, she said with a kind smile. Landry picked up a mug and took a long smell of the hot brew, moaning with pleasure. Ma'am, I know we just met, but if you keep this up, I just might make you Mrs. Landry. Bold of you to think you can handle me, Sonny, she replied with a little wink. Whitaker punched him in the shoulder and laughed as her companion grinned at the feisty old lady. Leon motioned to the computer screen. Okay, this is the current fire we need to put out, he said, and zoomed in on the eastern edge of town. There were two large buildings separated by some sports fields. But instead of green grass, the area was just black. On the right is the middle school, which is, to the best of our knowledge, empty. On the left, however, is the high school, where we have a dozen or so survivors who need our help. Hammond squinted and leaned forward. What's that black area in the middle? He asked. Our best guess? Leon shrugged. Three to four thousand zombies. There was a long silence as everyone digested the information. Hope you got a small army to take that out, Mathis finally said. Rogers grimaced. Just the people in this room, he raised his mug. Minus Ethel, of course. The older woman raised her eyebrow with a playful glare. Not that we doubt your abilities, Leon said with a grin. But you make coffee better than anyone in town, and we aren't going to risk that. She patted him on the shoulder and then headed off with the empty tray. Whitaker let out a deep whoosh of breath. Even with just us, we should be able to handle it if we're careful. She pointed to some of the buildings on the screen as she continued. If we set up some fire teams here, here, and here, we should be able to pick them off. It's going to make for a long ass day, but it's doable. Problem is, we don't have near enough ammo to take them all out, Trenton cut in. And we're still going to need bullets for when we have to venture out. Landry scoffed. No manpower and no bullets? He pulled a flask from his pocket and poured a glob into his cup. I'm gonna have to whiskey this up if this is the shit I'm dealing with today. He held out the flask to Whitaker, who gladly poured a shot into her mug as well. The sergeant crossed his arms. So what's the plan, Leon? He asked. Honestly, I was kinda hoping you guys had some ideas, Leon admitted. Trying to figure out ways to keep the cartel happy has taken most of my attention. Hammond nodded, pursing his lips. Well, let's see what we can come up with. He motioned to the screen. Can you give me a full view of the town? Leon clacked on the keyboard and pulled it up, zooming out to show the whole town. The soldiers leaned over his shoulders to get a good look. What about this canal-looking thing to the south? Whitaker asked, pointing at the screen. Can we lure them down there and contain them? Maybe have them swept away? Leon shook his head. It's way too shallow, he said. It may slow some of them down, but that's about it. What about just pulling them out into the desert to the east? Landry asked. Couldn't be that hard to get them moving as a herd and circle back to town. We considered that and put it in the last resort pile, Rogers admitted. It's way too close to the interstate, which is our only lifeline to areas that were formerly civilization. If taking out the cartel head doesn't work, we still need to get out to those areas, and going through packs of zombies would make that more difficult. Landry raised an eyebrow. So no road warrior stuff then? Another few weeks of dealing with the cartel, and that might be a better alternative, Trenton put in dryly. Leon took a deep breath. And... Not wanting to put a damper on things, but we are really going to have to watch it when it comes to popping off shots. 
We know, because ammo is tight, Landry replied with a nod. Leon grimaced. Yes, that, but also we haven't cleared much of the town at all. So if you start trying to take out the horde, you could potentially find yourself surrounded if you aren't careful. Landry ran a hand through his hair. This keeps getting better and better. Do you care about the buildings? Hammond piped up. Rogers and Leon glanced at each other and shrugged. The detective spoke first. I mean, we'd like to keep the school buildings standing if possible, just in case we need a fallback defensive position in the future, he said. Other than that, we don't really care. I think we can arrange that, the sergeant replied. Landry's eyes lit up like a kid at Christmas. We gonna blow some shit up, Sarge? Not quite, Landry, Hammond said, shaking his head. Leon, is there a toy store in town? A super center, anything like that? Reed laughed. In this town? He asked. I think it's lucky there's even a gas station. Pardon my friend, he's an idiot, Trenton said, no trace of humor in his voice. What are you looking for? Reed pouted, but didn't argue. Water guns, Hammond replied. The bigger, the better. The group all glanced around at each other, struggling to think of anywhere that would be available. Hey, Ethel, Leon called. She looked up from her desk. Need a refill, hon? He looked down into his empty mug. Well, that too, he admitted. But can we borrow you for a minute? She grabbed the carafe and strolled over. What can I do for you? She asked as she refilled everyone's cups. Ma'am, Hammond began, inclining his head to her. Do you know anywhere in town where we can find water guns? She put a finger to her chin for a moment. There's a little mom and pop grocery store on First Street, but I forget the cross street, she said thoughtfully. If you go down first, you can't miss it on the corner there. They had a pretty big toy section, if I remember correctly. As she filled his mug, he nodded and smiled. Thank you so much, ma'am, he said. This helps a lot. If y'all need anything else, just holler, Ethel said, and headed off back to her desk. Clara raised her hand. Okay, I'll be the one to ask. What in the world are you going to do with water guns? Well, since there is a gas station here in town, the sergeant replied. I figured we could fill those bad boys up with some kerosene and create us a makeshift flamethrower. There was a moment of stunned silence, and then a grin broke out on Leon's face. He rummaged through his desk to find a wad of paper, tape, and a pencil. He crumpled the paper and stuck it on the end of the pencil, lighting it on fire with his lighter. The rest of the group nodded. That looks like a lot of fun, Clara admitted. Hammond grinned. Well, consider yourself drafted then, he declared. We'll get us a truck, and I'll chauffeur you around to barbecue these fuckers. I'm in, she exclaimed. Leon nodded. That'll be good. You two can peel some of the main group off and set them on fire when you get away from the schools, he said. If they wander into a house or two, it's not a big deal. I don't know about the rest of you, Whitaker cut in. But I don't want to rely solely on fire to take these things out. They can be resilient if the flames don't completely engulf them. The detective cocked his head at her. You ever play softball? I was more of a basketball girl. She replied with a shrug. It allowed me to bang into people more, but I can swing a bat with the best of them. Rogers turned to the screen. Leon, pull up the elementary school. He did so to the east of the middle school, just across the street. There were almost no zombies by the elementary school. That's the play, Rogers declared. We can get into the elementary school and hit the equipment room. Should be some bats in there. Whitaker furrowed her brow. Wouldn't it make more sense to hit the middle school? They'll have full-sized bats. Little league bats are the way to go, the detective replied. They're shorter, so we can use them effectively in tight quarters. But they're still aluminum, so they'll hit just as hard as the others. She nodded. I like it, she agreed. Count me in. Looks like we've got two teams, Leon replied. So what do you guys want to do in this little escapade? Landry raised his hand. I just want to fucking shoot shit. What about you, Mathis? Leon asked. The sniper leaned in. Can you please move it over to the middle school? 
he asked. Leon did so, and the younger man pointed to a small batch of zombies on the east side of the school. I want to shoot shit as well, Mathis said. Only from the top of the school, there. Leon shook his head. I appreciate the enthusiasm, young man, but if we're going to have fire teams, we need them on the ground so they can pull batches of those things off of the main horde. Leon's right, Hammond agreed. We need shooters on the ground, not up high. Mathis shook his head. With all due respect, Sarge, Leon is wrong, and so are you. The sergeant blinked at him, and then his gaze darkened a bit at the challenging tone. All right, Mathis, Rogers cut in, holding up his hands. State your case. I'm the best shot in this room, the sniper declared, and cocked his head when Leon snorted. You coming out there with us? Mathis asked. Leon wrinkled his nose. No, he admitted. The good detective there won't let me. Then I'm the best shot that's going out there, Mathis continued. I get on that roof, and it's one shot, one kill. Two if I can get those fuckers to line up just right. Not only can I make every bullet count, I can direct traffic from up there as well. Hammond scratched his chin for a moment, and then let out a deep breath. He is the best shot on the team. Yeah, but how the hell are you gonna get up there? Landry asked. Mathis motioned to his teammates. I'll go to the elementary school with Rogers and Whitaker, he said. Once your team starts opening fire, it should break them up enough for me to get over there. It's only a one-story building, so it won't be a big deal to get on top. How many shots you got? Rogers asked. The sniper shrugged. About a hundred, give or take. I got a few hundred more I can throw your way, too, Leon added. The detective nodded. Looks like we got ourselves a sniper. Well, boys, Landry said, turning to Trenton and Reed. I guess that means we're on ground duty. Hope you all like running and gunning. Running? Reed shook his head. No. Gunning? Still a no, but I like it better than the first part. Landry barked a laugh and smacked his shoulder. That's the spirit, boy. Leon pulled up the map around the high school and highlighted a housing complex across the street. You three should start here, he said. Try to pick off as many as you can. When they get close, fall back to the next street and repeat. We'll be monitoring things, so when you get a group, we'll do a flamethrower drive-by, Hammond added. Landry held up a finger. Just don't set me on fire again. Again? Trenton raised an eyebrow. The sergeant sighed. I said I was sorry. Trenton and Reed shared a concerned glance until Landry and Hammond began laughing. Relax, boys, you'll be fine, the sergeant said, waving his hand. The detective motioned for the door and set down his empty mug. All right, let's get geared up, he said. This is gonna be a long day. After they congregated at the barricade on the edge of town, geared up to the tits, Leon handed out copies of town maps, crudely drawn on printer paper. Rogers chuckled as he looked at his. Guessing they didn't teach fine art and basic, he teased. Granted, I can't draw for shit, Leon replied. But I can paint the walls with someone's brains from 500 yards. Hammond grinned. Given our current situation, I'd say that's a much more useful skill. No argument here, Rogers replied. Leon knocked on the side of the car in the middle of the barricade to get everyone's attention. All right, let's settle down now, he said. If you'll refer to the wonderfully drawn maps in front of you, you'll see every team's starting position. Hammond and Clara have the shortest distance to go, so they're on their own timetable. Rogers, Whitaker, and Mathis, you guys are making the long haul. You tell me, how long do you need to get into position? The trio leaned over their map, conversing quietly as they plotted their course. Rogers finally turned back. Give us 20 minutes? 20 minutes it is, Leon nodded. We'll synchronize our watches before heading out, which means Landry, you and the boys will have plenty of time to get into firing position. When those 20 minutes are up, you go hot. Landry raised a fist. We'll make it happen. Now if you'll notice, there are three areas circled on the map. Leon continued. One to each of the north, west, and south. These are rally points, so if shit starts going bad, we have a meeting point. Clara raised her hand nonchalantly. Uh, Leon said, raising an eyebrow. 
Yes, Clara? She pointed to her map. What's the start of the west of our destination? That's the extra mission I need you to do, he explained. Ethel said that's the school district's garage. We need to know if the buses are still in there. The sergeant nodded. We can do a drive-by, not a problem. All right, if there's nothing else. Leon looked around, but nobody spoke up. So do you guys want to do a whoa team or something? He put his hand out, palm down, and not a single person joined him. A laugh rippled through the group. Yeah, I didn't think so. All right, everybody be safe and vicious. Now let's get those watches set in three, two, one. Chapter four. Landry, Trenton, and Reed crept quietly into the backyard of a house about 80 yards away from the massive zombie horde. They'd taken the long way around town in order to avoid detection. The street around the house was empty. It seemed any zombie in the area had made its way to the main group with all its groaning and shambling. Reed tugged on the back patio door, but shook his head. Landry motioned for him to get out of the way and knelt down in front of the lock, pulling out his lock picking tools. Reed and Trenton stood with their backs to him, keeping an eye on the area. After a few moments, the deadbolt clicked open and Landry readied his knife. He nodded at his partners before opening the door and rushing in. He gave the house a quick sweep, a spread out, open concept floor plan, single story. It was devoid of life. We're clear, he said as Reed and Trenton joined him inside, sliding the patio door shut as quietly as possible. They headed to the front of the house, clustering around a large window that overlooked the field between the two schools. Thousands of creatures shambled around each other, a writhing mass of rotted flesh. Do you think they even know why they are there? Reed asked as he stared at the horde with awe. Trenton shook his head. Probably the same mentality that led to 80s hair, he said. One person started doing it, and before you know it, there was a hole in the ozone from all the Aquanet being sprayed due to everyone following that first dumbass. Or maybe they're just mindless creatures who heard a noise and can't let it go, Landry cut in. Or now stay with me on this one. It doesn't fucking matter why. They're over there, and we have to start killing them. That's the only thing that matters. Now stay focused and get ready to shoot. The boys blinked at him and then nodded, mouths shut. He opened up the front door, quietly slipping out onto the lawn. They took up a flanking position behind him inside the house, opening up the windows on either side of the door to get into a firing position. Landry stood, basking in the warm sun for a moment, enjoying the last moment of peace he would get for the day. He glanced down at his watch, noting there was about 10 seconds before the 20 minutes was up. Fuck me, he muttered to himself with a sigh. Really should have volunteered to join Mathis on that rooftop. He stared out at the horde, less than a football field away, the zombies were almost one with each other, just a sea of moaning gunk. He zoned out for a moment, almost hypnotized, and then snapped out of it. He took a deep breath and then yelled, Come and eat me, you rotted motherfuckers! He raised his rifle and fired several shots, one after the other. The zombie mass was so thick that he couldn't even see if he landed any shots, but they did their job. About a hundred creatures turned their attention towards the screaming soldier and lumbered his way. Yeah, come get some, he bellowed, and then glanced over his shoulder at the two boys in the house, who simply stared at him. Well, what the fuck are you two waiting for, an invitation? Start shooting. They finally clicked into gear, aiming their own guns and firing at a deliberate pace. The group of zombies that had broken away from the horde grew to a few hundred as they moved closer. A gap opened between them and the main horde, and Landry signaled to stop shooting. Whoa, whoa, we're good, he said. Just gotta wait for them to get here. Reed lunged for the window frame. Landry, look out, he cried. The soldier quickly whipped around and saw half a dozen zombies pouring out from around the house. He rapidly raised his weapon and fired several well-placed shots, dropping bodies with headshots but the bodies were quickly trampled by twice as many. Shit, 
He abandoned his position and rushed inside, slamming the door and clicking the deadbolt shut. Where in the holy fuck did they come from? Reed shook his head as he shut his window. I don't know, but there's a ton of them. Trenton slammed his window shut and then rushed down the hallway to the side bedroom. He opened the curtains to see easily 80 to 100 zombies pouring out of a nearby apartment complex. Most of them moved to the front of the house. A dozen or so worked their way to the back. He barreled back to the front. We gotta go now, he huffed. They're coming in from the apartment complex next door. How many? Landry demanded. Trenton shook his head. Too fucking many. Good enough count for me, the soldier replied, and led the boys through the house back to the patio door. There were three zombies pressed up against the glass, gnawing and moaning at it. Landry stopped just short of the door, raised his rifle, and fired right into the glass. He shattered it, but placed three headshots, dropping the enemy. Let's move, he barked. They burst through the broken doorframe and into the backyard. Ten or so creatures headed their way. He kicked a nearby straggler in the torso, sending it flying off of the back deck. The trio tore towards the next target house, about a block away. Landry took aim and fired a few more times behind them, knocking down a few more zombies. He backpedaled slowly, keeping a close eye on the house they just abandoned. Come on, take the bait, he muttered. Come on. He stayed in his position, even as zombies closed in on him. He stayed focused on the side of the house, waiting for the breakaway group from the horde to follow them. One zombie got within a few feet of him, and he blew its head apart at point-blank range. Wait your turn, bitch, he snapped, and returned his attention to the house, relieved to finally see the mini horde coming around. Fuck yeah. He raised his rifle and popped up a few more rounds before retreating to join Trenton and Reed at the next house. What the hell are you waiting on me for? He cried when he reached them, standing outside of the patio door. Get inside. Trenton flung open the door and rushed in, doing a sweep of the living room. Clear in here. We're clear, Reed called from the hallway after checking all of the bedrooms. Landry closed the patio door behind him, staring out at the zombies coming their way. This just got interesting, he declared, and pulled out his radio, raising it to his lips. Leon, come in. Go for Leon, came the reply. Fire team reporting in, Landry said. We got a whole mess of those things heading our way. You ready for the fire? Leon asked. Landry nodded, peering outside. Anytime will be good, he said. They should be on us in five, but we can hold them here for a bit. I'll let Hammond know, Leon came back. You boys hunker down. The soldier shook his head and took a deep breath. Ain't gotta tell me twice, he said. We'll be ready when they get here. Ten four, came the reply. Leon out. Landry put the radio away as the boys came to the window, staring with wide eyes at the horrifying sight. Well, Trenton sucked his lower lip. We certainly got their attention. Reed let out a hysterical laugh. Understatement. The flamethrower will be here soon, Landry said. We need to get this place locked down and make sure the escape route is clear. Trenton nodded. I'll handle the escape, he said. Reed, you help Landry. The trio sprung into action, Trenton running through the house to make sure that the back door was unlocked. He checked either side to look out, making sure there wasn't another apartment complex nearby that could surprise them. There was nothing of note that seemed big enough for that. Reed and Landry shut the front door, before moving the couch in front of it. The soldier smacked the thick wooden door. It's sturdy, he said. But if enough of those things start pressing against it, the frame could give way. Reed nodded. Looks like we're about to find out if the builder was a cheapskate or not, he said, and cracked open one of the windows before taking aim and firing at the zombies. Landry chuckled as he opened his own window. You're right about that, kid. Chapter five. Rogers, Whitaker, and Mathis approached the back of the elementary school from the desert to the east. There were no zombies on that side of the building, so they rushed up and took cover. Whitaker held up a hand. I'll find us a way in. 
She crept over to a series of windows, peering in to see if the coast was clear. When she saw no movement, she inspected the frames to see if there was a way to easily open them. The two men headed for the corner of the building, looking around the side towards the middle school across the road. As they took in the giant cluster of zombies crowded around the front, Rogers took a deep breath. Gotta admit, that looked a little more manageable from the satellite imagery. Mathis shook his head. Won't be much of a problem once the shooting starts, he explained. Should peel enough of them away that I can get over there. He raised his rifle, peering through the scope to survey the area. Off to the side of the building was a large air conditioner that was several feet tall. All right, found my roof access, he murmured. Rogers crossed his arms. Assuming you can get there, he said. What's the plan if the shots in the distance don't break them up enough? I'll start luring them this way with a few shots of my own, Mathis said with a grin. Assuming you two can handle it. The detective glanced back at Whitaker, who was jamming a knife blade underneath the lock of a window before gripping it and tearing the frame from its hinges. I think I'm in good hands, Rogers replied. You do what you gotta do. Whitaker waved at him. Hey, Rogers, we're in, she declared. The detective patted Mathis on the shoulder. Go get him, he said, and we'll see you on the other side. He saluted his new friend and headed over to the window. He motioned for Whitaker to go first, but she pursed her lips and pointed for him to go. He held up his hands, palms out, and clambered up through the hole. He staggered a bit into the classroom, which looked eerily untouched from the last day of school before the apocalypse. He raised his gun and gave it a sweep just to be sure, thankful that the morning sun streamed in on this side to illuminate it so well. Whitaker vaulted in gracefully, nary a stumble, and fell into a crouch, joining the sweep as she landed on her boots. Any idea where the equipment room is? She asked. Not a clue, Rogers replied and shook his head. But this place isn't that big. Let's hit the gym and go from there. She nodded. Lead the way. The detective reached the classroom door, slowly opening it while keeping his handgun at the ready. Whitaker had her own handgun and flashlight ready to go, and nodded. He threw open the door, and they burst into the hallway, back to back, each checking aside. At the far end, there were three zombies who began to stagger towards the light. We're clear behind us, Rogers reported. Whitaker nodded. Let's head this way and take these guys out. They walked casually forward, checking each doorway as they passed, finding them locked up tight. Can I ask you a question? Whitaker asked as they walked. The detective nodded. Go for it. Did the cartel really shoot your ear off to teach you a lesson? She motioned to her own ear for emphasis. Rogers cocked his head. Well, if I'm being honest, he admitted. Rodriguez didn't do it to teach me a lesson. Wait, Rodriguez did that to you? Her eyes widened as she let go of another locked door handle. Isn't that the guy we're trying to help take control of things? He chuckled. The very same. He raised his gun to fire into the trio of zombies, taking out one with a headshot. Whitaker fired twice, two quick bullets to the face, and the corpses dropped. They waited for a moment, straining their ears to make sure nothing else was coming for them. Okay, she said finally. You're gonna need to explain that one to me. Rogers shrugged. Not much to tell, really, he replied. He did it to save my life. I was in a tight spot, and it was the only way to convince the others in the room that he took me out. I'm guessing you trust him then, she asked, checking another door. The detective nodded firmly. He risked his life to save mine. You can't discount that, he replied. Plus, it's not like we have many other viable options at our disposal. This is true, Whitaker sighed. They turned the corner into a wide hallway and noted the set of double doors at the end, glass panels showing off the basketball nets inside. Looks like we found the gym, Rogers said. They made their way to the door, pinning themselves against it and peeking through the glass. It was a typical gymnasium, hardwood floor with several basketball hoops and sets of bleachers. What wasn't typical was the dozen or so zombies roaming about. Thank God it's not a capacity crowd. Rogers muttered. Whitaker checked her handgun ammo. Not going to be difficult to handle, though. 
the detective narrowed his eyes, studying something along the far wall. Something catch your eye? Whitaker raised an eyebrow. He pursed his lips. Not yet. He put his fingers to his lips in a hush sign, and then gently pushed the door open just a smidge so he could look down the baseline to the wall. He grinned at the sight of an equipment door left ajar. He closed the door silently and grinned. Bingo. Got our room? Whitaker asked. He nodded. Yep, just a quick trot up the baseline and we're in. Any of those things in our way? She raised an eyebrow. Nope, he replied, shaking his head. Closest one is near midcourt. Whitaker holstered her weapon. What do you say we test out those bats? She asked. You know, quality control. The detective winked at her and put his gun away too. Just so you're aware, she said with a smirk. That firefight in New Mexico started because a guy grabbed my ass without permission. He grinned. Guess I'll have to wait for permission then. He stepped into the gym and she chuckled, shaking her head before following him in. They jogged to the equipment room and scanned the walls. Every kind of ball lined the walls, packing the room full of stuff. Finally, after a bit of digging, Rogers found a barrel full of little league bats. He stood up with one. Batter up, he said, holding it out to Whitaker. She held up her finger. Hang on a sec. She grabbed a thick rubber dodgeball, noting the zombies attracted to the rummaging noises from the equipment room. She reeled back and hoofed it full speed out of the room. It smacked a zombie directly in the face, sending it tumbling back onto its ass. She grabbed the bat and stepped out onto the court. A ghoul tripped over its fallen friend, and Whitaker let loose with a vicious swing, catching the creature right in the temple. The force of the blow and the angle sent the zombie flying off to the side, slamming against the wall before hitting the ground. You were right, she said in awe. The shorter length is much more efficient than the full-sized ones. I never would have thought of this. Rogers emerged, carrying his own bat, slamming it down on the top of the dodgeball zombie's head, crippling it before it could regain its footing. Yeah, my neighbor was on the force with me, and every now and then he'd get stuck on the overnight shift, he explained. His kid was like six or seven, so he asked if I could hit a few grounders to him after work. Turned into a daily ritual there for a while. Whitaker smiled as she took out another ghoul with a ping. That's unexpectedly wholesome, she said. Yeah, well, after dealing with the shit show in this city, it was a welcome reprieve from reality he replied, and turned to cave in the head of another skull. Speaking of escaping reality, mind if I hit some grounders to you after this? She smirked. I'm more of an indoor activities kind of girl. She rushed towards the next two zombies closest to her. She swung, hitting the first one so hard it tumbled into the other one, sending them both to the ground. She didn't let up, immediately cracking their skulls. Rogers cracked a smile and stepped up to join her as they carefully but casually walked around the gym, taking out the zombies one by one. Within a few minutes, the job was done. Creatures splayed across the hardwood with caved-in heads. Well, that's 12 down, he said. So we're like halfway there, right? As soon as he was finished speaking, there was the sound of muffled gunshots from outside. Whitaker inclined her head. Sounds like they're taking out the other half now. Rogers nodded. Pretty sure there's a duffel bag in the storage room. Let's load up and head out. Chapter Six Mathis remained at the corner of the building well after Rogers and Whitaker had entered the building. The zombies across the street remained fixated on the middle school. He let his mind wander a bit, wondering what drew their attention in the first place. Did some poor soul try to find refuge in the building? only to become trapped like those in the high school, he thought. Did an animal get spooked by them and end up cornered in the entranceway? Or did one of those dumb motherfuckers see their reflection in the glass and try to attack it, only to have dozens of others join it? He shook his head, reminding himself that it didn't matter in the grand scheme of things. He needed to focus on the task at hand. Gunshots rang out in the distance. About damn time, Landry he muttered, and slung his sniper rifle over his shoulder, preparing to make a run for it. As he waited, 
He noticed that only a couple of the zombies on the fringe edge of the horde were attracted by the noise, with most staying put. Shit, he thought. The building must have shielded them from the sound. He gave it another few moments, hoping that more would break away, but they never did. Finally, Mathis pulled his rifle from his shoulder and aimed downrange. He took a deep breath. Let's do this. He squeezed the trigger. The bullet from his high-powered rifle ripped through the back of a zombie skull and pierced straight through into the head of the creature in front of it, dropping them both. The thundering blast from the weapon gained the attention of several zombies, and they turned his way, mouths open with hungry screams. He aimed and fired a few more times, getting the majority of his horde to turn his way. As they began to shamble towards him, he slung his weapon over his shoulder again. Mathis walked out into the parking lot of the elementary school, keeping a close eye on the several dozen zombies from the middle school, slowly working their way towards him. He moved over to the far left side of the lot, drawing the attention of the creatures towards him. Even those furthest away to the right joined them and away from his air conditioner. That's right, come on, he said, waving them forward. Just need a few seconds to work with. He kept his head on a swivel, making sure that his gunfire didn't attract any unwanted attention from other areas. Luckily, no surprise hordes showed up. He focused on the air conditioner, noting that the zombies were a good 20 yards away from it. He took a deep breath and then broke into a sprint, running diagonally across the parking lot to the right and towards the road. The zombies just reached the asphalt, and he ran along the line, keeping about 10 yards between him and the front of the horde. He darted around them and made a beeline directly for the air conditioner. The zombies turned, following the movement and sound, and began to return towards the school. Mathis reached the unit and hopped up on top of it, hauling himself the four feet up onto the bright silver metal. He turned to the roof and fell into a crouch, ready to spring up and grab the edge of the roof. He leapt up, but his fingertips barely grazed the edge, slipping off and sending him back down onto the unit with a metallic thunk. Shit, I'm too heavy. He took off his rifle and tossed it up onto the roof, and then hucked his ammunition bag up there as well. Once he heard the safe clang of his equipment, he jumped again and managed to wrap his fingers around the edge. Just as he strained his biceps to haul himself up, there was a crackling, scraping sound, and the aluminum siding crumbled beneath his weight. His eyes widened at the realization, too late to do anything, and he careened down. He tried to get his feet under him, but there wasn't enough height, and he hit the AC unit hard with his back, flopping down onto the ground. Moans overwhelmed him as he struggled to breathe. The wind knocked out of him from the fall. He drew his handgun and fired at two of the closest zombies, dropping them so that the others would trip over them, buying him a precious few seconds as he hobbled towards the front of the school, gasping and huffing. He found the doors locked, yanking on them desperately. He glanced back over his shoulder, seeing that he only had a few seconds before the ghouls were on him. He fired at the glass portion of the door, shattering it. He dove headfirst through, the small jagged pieces still sticking up from the bottom of the frame, tearing into his gut. He seethed, but none felt too deep, and he aimed at the hole that the zombies clustered around. They reached through at him, but with it being chest height, they couldn't get in. He fired at the lead zombie, and it slumped into the hole, acting as a plug, at least for the time being. Mathis took a moment to gather himself, taking a look at his wounds, and finally taking a deep, nourishing breath after having the wind knocked out of him back there. A moan echoed in the darkness, and he whipped towards the noise, aiming his handgun. He stayed motionless, waiting for something to emerge from the shadows, but it never did. He reached for his flashlight and turned it on. The light revealed a zombie missing the bottom portion of its legs, crawling towards him. It was hard to tell if they had been eaten off or crushed, but either way, he grimaced at the sight and walked over, using his knife to end the creature's misery. Okay, he muttered to himself. Think, how the fuck you getting up to the roof now? He looked around, down each hallway, trying to figure something out. Finally, he focused on a sign on the wall with an arrow pointing to the right that read auditorium. 
He tapped his chin. If any place is going to have roof access, it's gotta be that, he thought. If they got lights, they gotta have a big-ass power source. He headed down the hallway, acutely aware of the superficial yet annoying wounds from the glass. He kept his gun and flashlight aimed high, and paused at every door opening on the way, careful. He reached the auditorium doors and cracked one open to peek inside. He was relieved to find the place deserted. About damn time something went my way. He pulled the door open fully and strolled into the cavernous room. He headed up the center aisle, making his way to the stage before hopping up. There was a ladder that went up to the catwalk above, but before heading that way, he turned to the empty seats, taking a bow in the middle of the stage. Thank you, thank you, everyone, he said, blowing kisses to an invisible crowd. I have indeed found my way to the top. He chuckled to himself and climbed up the ladder to the catwalk. He shone his flashlight along the ceiling, finally finding a small hatch and popping it open easily. As he emerged up onto the roof, the sun blinded him for a brief moment, which sent his heart into overdrive, considering there may be a threat nearby. He scrambled up and squinted, raising his handgun just in case. But as his eyes adjusted, he realized he was alone. He breathed a sigh of relief and headed over to his ammo bag and gun, checking to make sure everything was in one piece before moving over to the side of the roof facing the horde. The zombies turned and screamed at him happily, reaching rotted arms in his direction. Yeah, you aren't going to be so excited to see me when I start shooting in a minute. He sneered and pulled out his walkie-talkie, lifting it to his lips. Hey, Leon, it's Mathis, come in. Good to hear from you, Leon replied. You make it to the roof okay? Mathis nodded. Had a little bit of trouble and had to go through the school, but I made it, he said. How did you get inside? Leon asked. The sniper scratched the back of his head. Shot the glass out of one of the front doors. All that came through the radio was a sigh. Mathis pursed his lips. Hey, man, it wasn't my first choice either, but I was about five seconds away from becoming a fucking snack. Did what I had to do. Yeah, I hear you, man, Leon replied, sincerity in his voice. Glad you made it safely. The sniper shrugged. If it's any consolation, I only took out the top part of the glass, and I'm pretty sure I plugged it so nothing can follow me. Thank God for little miracles, huh? Leon asked. Ain't that the truth? Mathis agreed. Any word on everyone else? There was a slight pause. Shit's going down everywhere, Leon replied with a sigh. But you just focus on your job. Just do me a favor. The sniper nodded firmly. Sure thing. Set aside some ammo, came the reply. I get the sense we're gonna need your shot by the time this day is over. Mathis glanced down at his ammunition bag. 10-4, I got you covered. Good man, Leon commended. Now go kill some shit. The sniper barked a laugh. Yes, sir. He put away his radio and took a deep breath before checking his rifle and getting comfortable. He scanned the crowd of zombies through his scope, seeing a wide variety of ages and ethnicities throughout the rotted horde. Man, this shit didn't spare anybody, did it? He shook his head and aimed, picking a target. The bullet went straight through the side of the corpse's head, dropping it to the ground. One down, he muttered to himself. He took his time finding his next target, knowing he needed to pace himself if he wanted to keep his sanity during the systematic cleansing of the town. Chapter 7 Hammond and Clara headed down a neighborhood street, looking around for a vehicle to borrow. There were a few cars in driveways, but they were hoping they could find a truck. You'd figure being in rural Texas there would be more pickup trucks, the sergeant said. Clara shrugged. I don't think there's much farmland around here, and with El Paso being the closest civilization, that could get pricey with the fuel in a truck. I guess, Hammond replied, rubbing his chin. Just looks like all those stereotypes lied to me. The two of them reached an intersection and looked in both directions. I think we have a winner, Clara said, pointing a few houses down to the right. There was a large black truck with a lift kit, bringing it several feet off of the ground. Hammond looked down at the ostentatious vehicle and grinned. 
Oh yeah, we're gonna fuck some shit up in that thing. He started down the middle of the road towards it, both of them keeping an eye out for zombie activity. You know, Clara, I have to admit, I'm kind of surprised you're out here with us. Why? She asked, raising an eyebrow as her lips turned down into a frown. Because I'm a girl? The sergeant shook his head immediately, waving his arms in front of his face. Oh, Lord, no, he assured her. You should see what Whitaker can do. Hell, I'm pretty sure she can kick my ass. What is it then? Clara cocked her head. He lowered his hands. What I mean is, you're a college kid with no formal training, he said. Yet here you are, out here holding your own. Well, my mother was a strong woman, and she raised me to be the same, she explained with a shrug. Just wouldn't feel right to sit on the sidelines and let everyone else fight and die when I can do something about it. Just don't go expecting me to do what Whitaker can do and we'll be good. Hammond chuckled, running a hand over his head. Yeah, that girl is a special one, he admitted. Just before we started heading this way, she fought two guys in full SWAT gear at the same time. It did not go well for them. My kind of girl, Clara replied, awe in her eyes. They approached the truck, doing a quick sweep around opposite sides. Hammond ducked and checked underneath. I'm clear, he declared. Clear here too, Clara replied. The sergeant approached the driver's side door and tried the handle, and to his surprise, it opened. God, I love these trust in small towns, he said, and bent inside to pull open the bottom of the steering column. Let me know if anything comes up. Clara kept a keen eye out, looking for movement. She noticed some bushes wiggling in front of the neighboring house. Looks like we have a couple of live ones, she said. Hammond paused. Need my help? She shook her head. They fell in the bushes, so they're gonna be a minute, she replied. Finish up what you're doing and we'll take them out then. He went back to work, and within a moment, the truck roared to life. There we go, he said, standing up with a smile. He glanced at the bushes as he stepped up beside his partner. It's your call, he said, as two zombies emerged from the leaves. You want my help, or do you wanna take them out and I'll give you some pointers? Clara pursed her lips for a moment, and then nodded. I believe a critique would do me some good. The sergeant held out his hand as if motioning her through a door he'd just opened for her. She bent down and picked up a fallen tree branch, about the size of a baseball bat, and moved toward the shambling corpses, now moaning with arms outstretched. She stepped towards the first one with the branch extended in front of her, jabbing it directly into the zombie's chest to drive it back into the bushes. The corpse fell ass over tea kettle into the thicket, and before it even hit the ground, Clara pulled her knife and stuck it through the eye socket of the other zombie. She pulled it out as the corpse fell in a heap at her feet and dropped the tree branch, patiently waiting for the next creature to come back at her. It crawled out of the bushes on its hands and knees, and she lunged down, stabbing it in the back of the head. She turned with a flourish, even giving a curtsy as Hammond clapped for her. Very impressive, he said with a smile. Nice use of the terrain, good improvisation with the tree branch. He raised a finger. Only suggestion I would make is that instead of sending one back into the bushes, you could have forced them both back by ramming one into the other. Even if you're ready for them, those things are deadlier on their feet than on the ground. Clara nodded. Noted, I'll do that in the future. A few more lessons and Whitaker might have some competition, the sergeant said and they shared a laugh before he motioned for her to follow him to the truck. Come on, we've got some shopping to do. They hopped up into the high truck and headed off towards the grocery store. It didn't look worse for wear, with the front door shut and the windows intact. I'm kind of surprised this place is still standing, Hammond mused. Would have thought the locals would have cleaned it out. It may have hit so quick that there wasn't time, she suggested. Leon has been talking to the people in the high school, and they said that they barely made it there after having left at the first sign of trouble. The sergeant pulled out his handgun. Of course, the other alternative is that the store owner locked himself up in there. I was never much of a fan of company before the apocalypse, Clara admitted, following his lead and drawing her own gun. Even less so now. Hammond reached out for the door and gave it a tug, 
finding it locked. He dropped to one knee and pulled out his lock picking tools. She kept watch for him and then turned when she heard the click as he opened the door. Stay close, Hammond said and pulled out his flashlight. He held it up next to his handgun before moving carefully inside. Clara followed him, gently closing the door behind them, locking the deadbolt to make sure there were no surprises. The grocery store was dark, with no power and very little light coming in from the skylights that looked like they hadn't been cleaned in years. Hammond led them across the aisles, pausing at each one to make sure that they were empty. As he approached the last one, he heard a scuffling noise, and he held up his hand to motion for Clara to stop. The sergeant darted around the corner, gun high, and immediately popped off two shots into the oncoming duo of zombies ambling towards him. What, you didn't want to critique my shooting? Clara joked. He shrugged and smiled. You're a Texan, I assumed you already knew how to shoot. Fair assumption, she replied. Hammond kept his guard up as he walked down the aisle, making sure the creatures were indeed dead. He gave them a good kick to make sure, before looking around to make sure that they were alone in the store. There were no other sounds echoing around. He finally holstered his gun. Come on, let's find the toys. They rushed through the store, finally finding the toy aisle. Hammond shone his flashlight on them, scanning everything until they found giant super soaker type guns. Clara grinned. Jackpot. She began pulling them down from the rack. Hammond caught them, ripping the packaging off. Clara made a noise of satisfaction as she inspected the sixth and final one. Nice, they sprang for the deluxe model. We get an extra water carrier. Or in our case, kerosene, the sergeant added. Come on, we need to grab some steel wool and head out. Still gotta hit the gas station. They loaded up and headed back outside and paused briefly at the sound of gunfire in the distance. Doesn't sound like they're wasting any time, Clara said. Hammond nodded. Let's get a move on. They hopped into the truck and he sped down the street, peeling out with the massive tires. She looked down one of the side streets towards the school, and her eyes widened. Holy hell, she breathed, as she gaped at the road packed with the zombies. It looks like they got the entire horde moving. Hammond shook his head. Let's hope not. It was only a few moments before they reached the gas station, and they hopped out as soon as the truck was in park. The sergeant rushed inside to flip on the generator while Clara manned the pump. Got it, she called as it sprang to life, and she carefully began filling up every tank on each gun, taking care to fill every one right up to the top. She knew they'd need every single drop in order to succeed. Hammond exited the gas station, carrying a spare gas can and a few bottles of water. He handed one to Clara, and she smiled as she took it. If you'd like, I can get you a soda instead. The sergeant motioned over his shoulder. She wrinkled her nose. Lukewarm soda? She shuddered. I appreciate the thought, but no, I think this will do just fine. There was more gunfire in the distance, and she pressed her lips into a thin line. Don't worry, Hammond said gently, noticing the worried expression on her face. There's gonna be a lot of gunfire today. She nodded. I know, it's just more than I expected. If I'm being truthful, me too, he replied, and pulled out his radio. Hey, Leon, come in, it's Sergeant Hammond. Leon came back almost immediately. Please tell me you are ready to roll. Hammond cocked his head to check how far the gas can was filling, and then nodded. We'll be ready in a few minutes, he reported. How's the fire team? In need of a little fucking backup ASAP, Leon replied. They bit off a little more than they can chew. The sergeant took a deep breath. We can hear the gunfire from here. We were thinking the same thing. He pulled out his crude map, unfolding it. Which house are they in? A block back of the initial house, Leon said. Hammond drew his finger along the pencil. Pretty sure I can figure out how to get us there. Yep, just get to the right street and follow the zombies, Leon retorted. The sergeant nodded to Clara as she finished filling the gas can. Let them know we'll be incoming, he said. Last thing I want is for Landry to accidentally shoot me. Leon chuckled. 10-4, sergeant, he replied. I'll let him know. 
Hammond put the radio away and picked up one of the full water guns. He jammed a pencil into the end of it and then stuck a piece of steel wool on the end of that. He dunked it in some of the kerosene and then set it ablaze. It glowed red hot and he stepped away from the vehicle to squirt the gun. A string of flame spread out across 10 feet. The liquid fuel sprang through the steel wool and scattering everywhere. He grinned and turned around, handing Clara the weapon. Watch yourself on the splashback, but other than that, it works great, he said, and began to get into the truck. She raised a hand. Hang on, I still have four more containers to fill up. We'll have to come back for them, the sergeant said. They need our help now. She nodded and hopped up into the back of the truck, loading up the rest of what was full. Before he got into the truck, he held out his lighter. Don't lose that, he said. It's got some sentimental value. Clara inclined her head to him with a smile. Wouldn't dream of it. Chapter eight. Hundreds of zombies were packed around the front of the small home, like sardines, as a constant stream of gunfire erupted from the windows. Landry, Trenton, and Reed manned them, firing at point-blank range as the zombies pressed against it. The bay window in the front living room shattered under the weight of the creatures, and they toppled inside, tripping over one another. They're inside, Trenton screamed, and all three men broke away from their stations to focus on the breach. Landry quickly shot the few that had fallen in, and Trenton took the ones in the window still scrambling to get inside. Reed rushed over to the couch and grabbed the coffee table, darting forward to press it against the zombie in the center. It struggled to break free and get inside, but Reed shoved back, wriggling the table left and right, keeping the corpses from steady footing to get inside. Trenton fired a few more shots, creating enough of a pile of slumped over zombies as a protective wall. Whatever we're doing, we'd better do it quickly, Reed demanded, holding the table up over the wall to try to plug the hole. Landry approached and pressed his hands against the table as well to help out, and Trenton ran to the back door to peer out. Heard you boys could use some backup, Hammond's voice came through the radio. Landry lifted his walkie-talkie to his mouth. It's about goddamn time, Sergeant, he snapped. We're about to get overrun in here. Well, we're gonna light them up from our end, Hammond replied. You boys may wanna make your way to the exit. Landry tilted his head towards the back of the house. Trenton, how are we looking? He yelled. Trenton studied the back window, noting the handful of zombies that had wandered around the house into the backyard. He strode back into the living room. If we're going to move, we should do it now, he declared. Only a few of them back there, but don't know for how long. Sarge, we're on the move, Landry said into the radio. Light these fuckers up. Reed stood on his tiptoes and peered over the top of their lineup, watching Clara stand up on the back of the truck. She gave the water gun a few pumps and then unleashed a stream of liquid fire that coated a large number of zombies. The flames quickly spread, engulfing dozens. Holy shit, we gotta move, Reed exclaimed, and he and Landry broke away from the coffee table barrier. It fell, and zombies flopped over into the house, but the three men tore through to the back door into the yard. The few zombies milling about immediately turned their attention towards them, and the trio quickly pulled their handguns and took them down with systematic precision. Come on, we gotta circle back to the school and hit the next house, Landry said. Reed took a deep breath. Oh, good, only ten more runs of this and we'll be good to go. That's the spirit. Landry grinned and clapped him on the back. Come on, let's pick up the pace. Reed shook his head, and he and Trenton jogged to keep up with the soldier as he led the way to the next house. Meanwhile, out front, Clara emptied an entire canister of kerosene into the crowd, which was near completely ablaze. A few hundred creatures, all on fire, some of which were finally dropping to the ground. Hammond rolled down his window and took a few shots at the ones that dared to stagger too close. Back it up now, I'm not losing any eyebrows today, he bellowed. Clara loaded up another bottle of kerosene and gave the gun several pumps before aiming it high. She sent another long blast of flame arching high through the air, hoping to hit the ones closest to the house. Whoops, 
she muttered as the front edge of the flames landed on the roof. The sergeant hung out of the window as the house began to catch fire. Nice shooting, Tex. Might have given that one a couple of pumps too many, Clara admitted. Hammond laughed. You think? He fired a few more shots at some nearby zombies, and then they watched as the flames fully engulfed the mini horde and the house, trapping the ones who'd entered through the bay window in search of their previous meal. Charred corpses filled the front lawn, no moving creatures within ten yards of the truck. I'd say our job here is done, wouldn't you? Hammond asked. Clara nodded. Damn straight. Come on, let's go get a refill, the sergeant said, and put the truck in gear. Clara knelt down and held on as they sped back to the gas station, leaving the flaming wreckage in their wake. On the way, she caught a glimpse of the trio of men rushing up another street, approaching the next house that faced the school. They paused and crouched about 40 yards from it, noting the dozen zombies milling about outside. Fucking hell, can't anything be easy? Reed muttered. Landry shook his head. Buck up, sport, just a handful of them, he said. And besides, we gotta kill them all anyway. All right, Reed replied, shaking his head as he reloaded his gun. So how we doing this? Trenton inclined his head. The back door looks like it's a slide open, he said. I say we rush by this group, get inside, and shore up the defenses. Safer to pick these guys off from the inside than fighting them in the streets. Agreed, Landry said with a nod. When we get up there, you two get inside first, and I'll handle any of the stragglers that get too close. Last thing we want is for one of those things to plug up the door when we're trying to get it shut. Trenton raised his weapon. All right, let's do it. They rushed forward, Trenton in the lead, and quickly made it to the corpses, staggered several yards away from each other. He lowered his shoulder and clipped a zombie as he ran by, sending it stumbling back into the others. Reed followed closely behind him, narrowly dodging outstretched hands as they went. Landry brought up the rear, knocking the creatures down as they lunged for his comrades. As they nearly reached the door, a zombie emerged from the inside, stopping in the doorway, and Trenton full-on barreled into it, sending the two of them flying into the dining room. The zombie smacked hard into the table, and Trenton wrapped his hand around its neck, keeping the mouth at bay. He pulled his knife and buried it into the creature's forehead before leaping back up to his feet. I'll get the front door, he said as Reed rushed in the door. You check the bedrooms. Reed nodded and headed down the hallway jumping at the sound of gunfire from outside. A blur slammed into him from the first bedroom, and then his side exploded with pain, and he slammed his gun down on a slimy, rotted head. The zombie didn't dislodge its teeth from his flesh, and he shoved it back, a primal scream leaving his mouth. He fired half a dozen shots into the creature's face, reducing it to nothing but ground meat. Trenton tore back into the hallway at the horrendous sounds, and stared at his best friend with wide eyes. She fucking bit me, Reed bawled, staring down at the bloody hole missing from his torso. Took a chunk right out, fuck. He raised his hands to his head, suddenly sinking in that this bite was a death sentence. He paced back and forth in the hallway, muttering incoherently to himself, as Trenton just watched on, helpless. Landry slammed the back door and came stomping through the living room towards his comrades. What the fuck was all that shooting? We're not ready to attract a cr- He stopped short at the sight of the young man bleeding all over himself. Oh, fuck me. No, Landry, fuck me, Reed snarled, turning towards them. Because I'm fucked. Trenton clenched his jaw, blinking a few times. He didn't know what to say. What did you say when your best friend was handed a death sentence? Reed took a deep, ragged breath and kicked open the door to the bathroom. He rummaged inside before emerging, holding a towel tightly against his wound. I need tape, he said. Trenton put a hand to his forehead. What? Tape, Reed yelled. I need some motherfucking tape. Landry darted to the kitchen, digging through cabinets and drawers before finally finding a roll of duct tape. Here we go, I gotcha. Reed raised his arm and held the towel in place with the other, 
motioning for the soldier to hurry up. Take me up then, he demanded. We got shit to do. Landry made quick work of taping the towel in place, securing the makeshift bandage. Man, Trenton babbled from behind him. We, we can get you back to the command center. You don't have to, fuck you, man, Reed snapped, whirling on his friend. This shit is costing me my life, so I'm gonna see it through. And don't you ever suggest that shit to me again. Both Trenton and Landry nodded, and the latter finished with his taping. That's as secure as it's gonna get, he said, and raised his chin. You ready to start fighting? Reed cocked his gun. Let's get the next batch going, he declared. I got some payback to deliver. Chapter nine. Mathis took careful aim, surveying the field of zombies to find just the right one. He honed in on a tall male, middle-aged but easily six feet tall and stout. He was hoping if he took out all the big ones first, that would make future combat easier if it came to that. He squeezed the trigger and watched as the creature's head exploded. It dropped to the ground, taking a few others with it under its heavy frame. The hole, however, closed quickly as the mass of ghouls covered it up. That's another one down, the sniper said with a sigh. He checked his ammo and noted that his gun was empty. He took a break to reload and survey the landscape. A few blocks away, there was a massive plume of smoke rising into the air. He raised his gun and peered through his scope, seeing the house across the way from the school with the busted out windows. Dozens of zombies had broken away from the field pack, attracted by the prior gunfire. He pulled his walkie-talkie out. Hey, Leon, it's Mathis, he said. Come in. How's my eye on the sky, Leon replied. The sniper took a deep breath. Doing my best to pick off the big boys in case we gotta go hand to hand. Hard to argue with that, Leon agreed. Do you have eyes on the fire team? Mathis nodded as he moved his scope. Yeah, it looks like they are at their next stop and preparing to draw another crowd, he said. Although you may want to give them a heads up that their noise has attracted a lot of attention. How much? Leon asked. The sniper cocked his head. Hundred, hundred and fifty of them have broken off and started wandering towards the fire, he reported. If they aren't careful, they could get flanked. How's it looking to the north? Leon asked. Mathis moved his gun again sweeping the northern area through his scope. A stray here and there, he said, but for the most part, they're staying put. Good, Leon came back. I've sent the other two teams to meet up about five blocks north so they can grab the bats and regroup. If you see anything heading their way, let me know. The sniper nodded. 10-4, and I'll do my best to pick off stragglers that head that way. Oh, and one more thing, Leon said. Mathis raised an eyebrow. What you got? Since you got a good vantage point on the situation, came the reply. How many do you think we need to peel off in order to do a mass burn safely? The sniper looked down over the edge at the zombies pressed up right against the school. He pursed his lips and looked through the scope at the high school. It appeared to be the same situation over there. Rotted corpses smooshed up against the bricks. At least half, maybe a little more, he mused. But even then, we run the risk of those things wandering over to the high school and setting it on fire. If my school gets lit, I can make a run for it. I'm going to assume the others can't. That's what I figured, Leon admitted. Looks like I'm gonna have to come up with something else. Mathis shrugged. Maybe Hammond found something in the garage that can help. One can only hope, Leon replied with a sigh. All of a sudden, gunfire erupted from the house that Landry and the boys were at. Fuck, Mathis blurted and rushed over to the southern edge of the roof to get a better look at the situation. A few hundred zombies began peeling off of the main group, and the hundred or so that were attracted by the previous firefight staggered back towards them. Leon, you gotta get them out of there now, the sniper gushed. They're going to be overrun. The line went dead as Leon disappeared to deliver the message. Mathis quickly raised his weapon and began firing towards the flanking zombies. He hit one of the front ones in the head, dropping it and causing a few to stumble. He continued to rapidly fire on the horde, hoping to buy his friends an extra few minutes. 
Chapter 10 Hammond drove towards the meeting spot, but turned off down a side street that led towards the school horde. Hey, Clara, he called through the back window. Make sure you're loaded up. We're gonna go fishing. She saluted him. Ready when you are, Sarge. He stopped a block from the school, with only a few dozen zombies in sight. He laid on the horn, filling the air with an obnoxious honk. Twenty or so zombies shambled towards them, arms outstretched. Hammond executed a three-point turn so that Clara was in the firing position. You just let me know when you're ready for me to move, he instructed. We're gonna creep up the road so they don't wander off into the neighborhood. She nodded. Yeah, I'd rather not burn the entire town to the ground if I can help it. Well, you're not fun, the sergeant quipped, and they shared a laugh. Clara lit the kerosene-soaked steel wool on fire and waited patiently for the zombies to get close enough to spray. Let's start leading them up a bit, she suggested. Hammond put the truck in drive and began inching along. As he started to move, she primed the weapon a few times before unleashing a stream of liquid death onto the enemy. They ignited quickly, but despite the flames, they continued to chase the truck and moan. It took about a block before they began to fall, no longer able to move due to the flames. Once it was down to just a few slow-moving ones crumbling to their knees, Clara sat down and patted out the fire starter before smacking the side of the truck. They're not getting out of the street, she called. We're good. All right, Hammond replied. On to the meat. He sped up, going down a few blocks before turning to the north. They drove for a few moments before making another turn, coming up on half a dozen zombies in the street, facing off against Rogers and Whitaker. The corpses were spread out a few yards apart from each other, giving the baseball bat wielding duo plenty of room to work with. The detective used the vertical bashing technique, caving in the top of the zombies' heads. Whitaker, however, opted for a traditional swing, snapping one zombie head right off so it hung limply from its shoulders from stretched out, rotted flesh. After a few more well-placed swings, the threat was gone, and the battlefield was quiet, save for the rumbling of Hammond's giant truck as he rolled up to them nice and slow. That's a solid swing there, Whitaker, he declared as he hung out of the window. But if you really want to go for the fences, you shouldn't drop your front shoulder so much. She rested the tiny bat on her shoulder and cocked her head. Wow, Sarge, I didn't realize you were a baseball coach. Coach? Hammond laughed and shook his head. Nah, but I was a three-time beer league home run champ. She rolled her eyes. Well, if your coaching will help me beat a bunch of out-of-shape dudes with beer guts, how can I possibly turn it down? Rogers barked a laugh as he approached, and Clara jumped down from the back of the truck. Hammond exited and slammed the door behind him, clapping Whitaker on the back to greet her. The detective pulled two bats out of the duffel bag and held them out. Hammond turned the little weapon over in his hand and then gave it a few practice swings. Eh, a little smaller than what I'm used to handling, but I think I can make it work. So how did the first flamethrower test go? Rogers asked, shifting his weight. Clara took her bat and grinned. Really good, she said. We took out, what, two, three hundred of those things? She turned to the sergeant. And a house, don't forget that. He pointed at her with his bat. Clara shrugged. And a house. So what's the plan now? Whitaker asked, hooking a thumb into the waistband of her pants. Hammond shook his head. Fuck if I know, he admitted. It's gonna take the fire team some time to get set up for the next run. Were you able to check out the school garage? Rogers asked. Clara nodded. Well, we did a drive-by, she said. Best we could tell there were a few buses in there. Could be useful, the detective replied. Yeah, maybe we could load up some zombies and drive them off to the cartel's doorstep, Whitaker suggested with a smirk. Rogers looked at the sky. You have no idea how much I'd love to do that, he said. I can imagine, she replied. He sighed. Spend a week here dealing with those pricks and their demands, and you'll be imagining up far worse stuff than that. A fucking men, Clara added. Gunfire erupted in the distance, and the quartet turned to face the noise. Looks like the fire team is ready, Hammond said, and checked his watch. My guess is we have 10, maybe 15 minutes before they are set up and need our help. Clara nodded. 
Hopefully they can pull a crowd like last time from the horde, she said. If they can keep doing that, we might actually be able to pull this off. Is it just me or does that sound a little off to anyone? Rogers asked, cocking a brow as the gunfire picked up in intensity. Hammond pulled out his radio. Hey, Leon, it's Hammond, you copy? He asked. There was no response, but the gunfire continued. Leon, do you copy? Silence. Rogers grabbed the duffel bag and headed for the truck. Looks like we need to get ready to move. Calm down, detective, the sergeant warned, holding up a hand. We can't do anything until the fire team moves to the backup house. I'm aware of that, Rogers replied with a nod. But when that call comes in, we're gonna be ready. He clambered up into the back of the truck, and Hammond nodded, conceding the point. Clara hopped up into the bed next to him, as the gunfire seemed to move a little farther away in the distance. There was a tense, silent moment, and then Hammond's radio sprang to life. Hammond, Hammond, Leon cried. Do you copy? The sergeant raised the walkie-talkie to his mouth. We're here. You meet up with Rogers and Whitaker? Came the panicked reply. Hammond nodded. Yeah, we got him, he said as he got into the driver's seat. What the hell is going on? The fire team is getting fucked hard, Leon explained. Got way more heat than they bargained for. They're on their way back to the second fallback house. The sergeant slammed his door. We're loaded up and headed out, he promised. We'll be on them in a minute. Negative, Leon replied. Do not take a direct route. You're gonna have to go a roundabout way to get to them. Hammond pursed his lips. How roundabout? You're gonna have to retreat to the grocery store, and then get a few blocks south of the house and approach that way, Leon instructed. The sergeant blinked at the radio. God damn, man, what the hell is going on over there? They pulled another group without realizing that the house fire drew a couple hundred after they left, Leon explained. The streets are packed with them. Hammond nodded as Whitaker jumped into the passenger seat. 10-4, he said. We're loaded up and headed out. He punched the accelerator and they sped towards the next battle, bats in hand. Chapter 11 Trenton and Reed fired repeatedly from the living room windows as zombies continued to press up against them. As soon as one head exploded, the body dropped, and another would take its place. Fucking hell, man, these things just keep coming, Trenton cried. Landry came running from the back of the house. Plug those holes as best you can, cause we gotta move, he demanded. The back is already thick with those motherfuckers. He pulled his walkie-talkie to contact Leon, but the front door began to creak. The wood around the frame began to splinter, and he threw himself into the door with every ounce of strength he had. He held out a hand as Trenton moved to help him. I got this, keep on that window, the soldier yelled. A crash echoed from the kitchen on the back of the house, and Trenton broke from his window to check. They're inside, he yelled, opening fire at the few zombies that had broken through the back glass patio door. It was as if the floodgates had opened, and the corpses began to pour in through the busted doors. Landry continued to hold the front door up with everything he had, knowing if he let up, they'd be done for. Trenton continued to shoot into the kitchen, but was forced to begin backing up to give himself enough room to fire. Get to the back bedroom, Landry yelled. He turned to Reed, who made a run for it followed quickly by Trenton. Landry took a deep breath and lunged away from the door. As soon as his weight left it, the entire frame gave way, and a flood of zombies poured into the living room. He didn't turn or fire, just ran as fast as he could down the hallway where the others waited for him. As soon as he got inside, Reed toppled a dresser across the door, sealing it, at least for the moment. Landry lifted his walkie-talkie to his lips, Leon, where the hell is our backup? Patching you in now, came the reply. The line clicked before Hammond came through. Looks like you boys have a bit of a shit show going on in there. Under fucking statement, Sarge, Landry snapped. What's your status? Hammond asked. The soldier took a deep breath. Full breach of the house, he reported. We're holed up in the back bedroom on the east side. The doorframe to the bedroom began to creak and moan. Landry, Trenton cried, pushing against the dresser. The soldier hit the button on the radio again. Thanks to some shitty fucking construction, not sure how long we can hold out. 
Stay calm, we'll get you out, Hammond replied. Outside, about a half a block away, the truck stood, looking at the backyard from the south. Zombies completely surrounded the property, not a single inch of space that wasn't occupied by a creature around the single-story dwelling. There's hundreds of those things, Whitaker breathed. No way we can clear enough of them out to get to Landry. Clara nodded in agreement. Fire's out, that's for sure. I'm open to ideas, Hammond replied. Rogers stared at the house, rubbing his chin, studying the property. He gazed up at a huge tree overhanging the house. He held out his hand for the radio. May I? He asked. Hammond handed over the device. Hey, Landry, it's Rogers, the detective said. I have an idea to get you boys out. I'm all ears, cowboy, Landry replied, hope in his voice. Rogers took a deep breath. I need you to get up on the roof. There was a brief moment of silence. How in the hell are we supposed to do that? Landry came back. We're trapped in a bedroom and the attic door isn't in here. Rogers sighed. Well, you said the house has shitty fucking construction, he said dryly. Just use one of those high-powered guns to shoot a hole in the ceiling and climb up. There was another brief moment of silence. Well, shit, Landry said sheepishly. That'll work. What the hell are we supposed to do once we're up there? There's a tree in the neighbor's yard that reaches over the roof, Rogers explained. You should be able to use it to get out of the yard. Once you're on it, we'll have Claire here light him up. Inside, the door to the bedroom broke free from the top of the frame, Trenton and Reed pressing up against the dresser with all they had. We're on it, Landry said into the radio and pocketed it before loading a fresh mag into his rifle. He flipped it to burst fire mode and aimed at the ceiling. Going hot, he yelled and unleashed several blasts into the ceiling, the cheap drywall shredding with each shot. After half a dozen trigger pulls, there was a decent sized hole in the ceiling. Reed, give me a hand, the soldier said. The young man in question glanced at his companion. You got this? Yeah, I'm good, Trenton assured him, pressing against the dresser as hard as he could. Go help him. Reed rushed over as the soldier climbed a bookcase against the wall. He held out his hand to steady Landry as he got his footing and started slamming the butt of his rifle into the ceiling, clearing out the debris to give them a path to the attic. He handed his rifle down and then leapt up, grabbing one of the beams that connected to the other side of the house. Once he was up, he drew his flashlight and handgun to do a quick sweep. Clear, thank fuck, he called, and then took a knee beside the hole. Come on, Reed, you're next, he said, and reached down for his gun. He helped pull Reed up, who grimaced at the stretching in his wound, pressing his hand hard against it as he knelt next to the hole. You gonna make it? Landry asked. Reed nodded and waved him off. The soldier laid down flat and stuck his head down through the hole, looking upside down at Trenton. Yo, you're up, he cried. Just run over and jump from my hand, I'll get you up. Trenton nodded shakily. Okay, he swallowed hard. You ready? Yeah, do it, Landry cried, hanging his hands down. Trenton leapt from the dresser, lunging towards Landry. As soon as he stepped away, the top half of the door crashed in, nearly tripping him up. Zombies poured into the room as he jumped for the outstretched hands. His legs dangled in the air as Landry yanked, and Reed reached down to help, pulling him up just as the zombies clustered in the center of the room. You all right? Trenton huffed as Reed fell onto his ass, wincing in pain. I really wish you guys would stop asking that, he snapped. If I'm not fine, I'll fucking tell you, okay? Come on, Landry cut in, giving Trenton a sympathetic nod. We still gotta get through the roof. He motioned for the two men to sit tight as he walked gingerly across the wooden platform in the attic. With as cheap as the material was, he didn't want to risk anyone falling through. As he walked, he tapped on the roof with the butt of his rifle, hoping to find a weak spot. Finally, he found one that gave way slightly. This is it, he muttered, and slammed his rifle through a rotted portion of the wood. Shingles cracked, and once there was a small hole, he slung his rifle over his shoulder and used his hands to pry the rest loose to make it big enough for them to fit. This shit is slanted, he called back, so make sure you have your footing before moving up. The other two nodded at him creeping to his position, and he went first, 
hauling himself up through the hole. He made sure his foot was secure on the shingles before attempting to move up to the center. He took out his knife and slammed it into the crappy material so the boys would have something to hold on to. As he pulled himself to the top of the roof, he looked down on both sides, noting the veritable sea of zombies. To the south stood Hammond and the crew with a big truck, waving at him. He waved back as Reed came up behind him. Who in the hell are you waving at? He demanded. Landry pointed to the sergeant, prompting the younger man to wave as well. Hey, can you do me a favor? Reed asked suddenly. I already asked Trenton and he agreed. Landry nodded. Anything, kid? Don't tell the others about my bite, he asked, drawing his lower lip between his teeth. We still have so much shit to do today, and it's only going to lead to pointless worrying. I know what my fate is, no sense in jeopardizing what needs to be done. Landry nodded and clapped him on the shoulder. You tell them whenever you're ready, he said. So long as it's by tomorrow, can't risk you changing on us after all. Reed couldn't help but chuckle, shaking his head. Military guy through and through. He nodded as Trenton finally made it up to the top. Hell of a view, ain't it? He asked and pulled the knife from the roof to hand it back to Landry. The soldier sheathed it. Yeah, just make sure you appreciate it from afar, he instructed. Come on, let's get out of here. He led the trio across the roof to the tree limb. It was huge, sturdy enough to support several people. One by one, they filed onto it and climbed over to the neighbor's yard. A few zombies below caught sight of them, reaching up and moaning at the dinner that was just out of reach. As soon as they dropped into the empty yard, Hammond and Clara sprung into action. The sergeant drove up to the back edge of the horde, and his fire starter unleashed a torrent of flame, coating the bulk of the zombies in the backyard. Hit the house, Hammond yelled. She raised her aim and landed some liquid fire on the roof, quickly engulfing the structure where their friends had been trapped. Good girl, the sergeant called through the window. Hang on, we're gonna swing around to the front. Hammond sped around, greeted by a few hundred creatures in the front yard. He opened fire from the driver's seat, taking down the ghouls closest to him as Clara unleashed her fire all over the place. Rogers and Whitaker, in the meantime, met up with the trio in the neighbor's yard, staying tight against the fence. Landry grinned as he hit the ground. Man, am I go- Whitaker put her hand over his mouth and motioned for him to follow Rogers. The detective led them to the south, through a yard and away from the carnage that Hammond and Clara created in the front. Finally, after a block of distance between them and the horde, Whitaker smiled. Glad to see you too, Landry, she said, putting a hand on his shoulder. Seems like you boys got in a bit over your heads. Nah, we handled ourselves just fine, he replied, puffing out his chest. But it was good to have some help. Could have been useful throughout the day. Rogers nodded. Well, I'm just glad you guys got out of there in one piece, he said. If that tree wasn't there, that could have been bad. Detective, I think I speak for the rest of us when I say that there's no way in hell we're doing another run like that, Trenton declared. Landry raised his hands, palms out. Hey, fucking men, brother. Hey, fucking men. Reed, do you concur? Rogers asked. And there was a long, awkward silence as the kids stared off into space. Reed, you with me, buddy? Huh? The younger man blurted and then nodded like a bobblehead. Oh, yeah, I'm not doing another run of that. Rogers nodded and pulled out his radio. Hey, Leon, you copy? Go ahead, Rogers, Leon replied. I think we need to regroup, the detective said, because this fire team stuff just isn't cutting it. I think I might have an idea brewing up, Leon said. Why don't you make your way back to the command center and we'll discuss it? Rogers nodded. As soon as Hammond and Clara get back from the bonfire, we'll be up there. I'll be waiting, Leon replied. The detective put the radio away as the truck rolled up. Man, that fire is raging, Hammond declared proudly. Another few hundred of those fuckers down. Landry, are you boys ready for another run? Rogers shook his head. We're changing gears. He motioned for everyone to hop up into the back with Clara. Head up to the command. Leon has an idea. The sergeant rolled his eyes. Oh, hell, we're in trouble now. Chapter 12. Leon, what do you have for us? Rogers asked as they entered the command center. 
The man in question hunched over his computer, carefully studying the area around the school. Come here and check this out. The group huddled around, pleased to see the massive horde at the school had thinned out quite a bit. So it looks like the fire team did their jobs because there is a significant reduction in zombies, Leon said, pointing to different areas on the screen. You can even see a fair amount of grass in the center there. Hammond clapped his friend on the shoulder. Well, I'll be damned. He did a hell of a job, Landry. First time for everything, Whitaker quipped. Landry put up his hands. Hey now, he declared. I didn't do this shit alone. Disparage me all you want, but these boys kicked ass out there today. He was uncharacteristically serious in his delivery, and his teammates were taken aback. Whitaker turned to the boys. Trenton, Reed, good job out there. Agreed, Hammond added. Good job. Anyway, Leon cut in. With the crack showing in the horde, I think we can use the buses that Hammond and Clara found. Rogers rubbed his forehead. Oh, this ought to be good, he moaned. What are you thinking? Well, that's a big enough gap to drive them through, Leon said. So there's seven of you. We get three buses on each side, drive them through on either side, and create a kill zone in the center of the field. Buses will act as a firewall against the flames, so you can burn them up. Hammond and Clara shook their heads in tandem. Couple problems with that, buddy, the sergeant said, putting up a hand. First off, those buses aren't going to have enough horsepower to push their way through the masses. Leon cocked his head. And the other problem? There's only four buses, Clara replied. Fucking hell. Leon scrubbed his hands down his face. That's not enough to block off both sides. Guess we're back to the fire teams. Landry shook his head emphatically. Fuck no, we're not. The room devolved into bickering back and forth, with the exception of Rogers, who leaned into the monitor, studying it quietly. Hey, Leon, he said but the room ignored him. Hey. He stood up and still ignored, put his fingers in his mouth and let out a deafening whistle. Everyone went silent, staring at him. Leon, can you get Mathis on the line? Rogers asked. His friend pulled out his radio. Hey, Mathis, you there? Yeah, what do you need? Came the quick reply. I'm putting you on speaker, Leon said. The rest of the group is here. Mathis scoffed. What? he asked. Everybody go on break and forget to tell me? Hey, it's Rogers, the detective said. Feel free to take five. I need your eyes. What do you need, detective? the sniper asked. Rogers leaned over the radio. How much of that crowd have you been able to draw your way with your firing? I've got maybe half of them paying attention to me, Mathis replied. Had a little more looking my way when I was covering for the fire team, but once I stopped shooting, they stopped caring. Rogers nodded. Okay, good, good, he said. Now I need you to look over the side of the wall and see if there are any speakers attached, you know, for the intercom system. Okay, hang tight a sec, Mathis said. After a few moments, he came back. Yeah, detective, got two big ones here. Rogers grinned. All right, thank you, he said. Hold on, we'll be back with you in a minute. He turned to Leon. We're gonna sacrifice the middle school to save the high school. Landry straightened up. Hell yeah, let's hear it. We're gonna sacrifice the middle school, Rogers repeated, pointing to the monitor. Whitaker and I can get in there, get to the office, and use the intercom system to create enough noise to draw the horde to us. Once they pull away from the high school, the rest of you can use the buses to create the firewall between the zombies and the high school, then light them up. Trenton furrowed his brow. But how are you going to get the intercom to work? They're hardwired with a battery backup. Leon cut in. They do it that way in case of emergency. Trenton nodded. Only concern I had. The room went silent for a moment, as if in anticipation of someone throwing out another objection or issue, but nobody did. Well, all right then, let's load this bitch up, Hammond declared. We need to stop by the gas station to fill up our flamethrowers, and then we'll be off to the bus depot. Rogers nodded. That should give us enough time to get into the school, he said. We'll retreat into the desert past the elementary school, so if you wouldn't mind picking us up afterward. I think that can be arranged, Hammond replied with a grin and led his team towards the truck. Whitaker kept pace with the detective, bringing up the rear. Since you so graciously volunteered me for your suicide run, 
I'm guessing you have a plan to get us out? Same way we go in, Rogers assured her. We clear a path, put the intercom into a feedback loop, open the doors to the horde, run out the front door, and then set it on fire. She let out a deep whoosh of breath. Oh, good. For a second there, I thought it was going to be something crazy. Well, since the last time someone forced themselves onto you, a war broke out. Please allow me to say this. Rogers rested a hand over his heart. Whitaker, would you give me the honor of going on this suicide mission with me? He held out a free hand to her. She burst out laughing. You're something else, Rogers. She playfully took his hand, and they headed towards the truck. Chapter 13 Whitaker and Rogers took cover behind the same corner that Mathis had manned before his run to the school. They carried their normal weapons, as well as water gun flamethrowers slung over their shoulders. Unlike last time, however, there were only a handful of zombies between them and the front door. Rogers studied the front entrance, and his heart sank. Fucking hell, he muttered. Whitaker's brow furrowed. What? Check out the front door, he said. It's open. She stared at the shattered double doors. Fucking hell. Looks like we're in for a fight, he said with a sigh. You game? She laughed. Game? She rolled her eyes. I've seen you in action, and I'm willing to bet that I take out more of them than you do. I'm down for that, he smirked. If I lose, I'll make you a home-cooked meal. She raised an eyebrow. What about dessert? Only if you give me permission, he winked at her. But what if I win? She shot him a sly smile. You get dessert. Well, batter fucking up, Rogers declared, and raised his little league bat. The duo ran towards the school, pausing only to crack a few skulls standing between them and the entrance. Whitaker grinned as they reached the shattered doors. That's three to two, she teased. Long way to go yet, he replied. They braced themselves against the still standing doors, peering through the busted glass. There was one unmoving corpse, but several bloody footprints heading in multiple directions. Office should be near the front, the detective said quietly. We find it, clear the room, and then you keep watch while I get the intercom going. Whitaker nodded. I'm good with that, she said. Lead the way. They leaned their flamethrowers against the insides of the door, readying them for retreat. Rogers headed through the lobby first, readying his bat, in case anything came out of the shadows. Whitaker stayed behind him, trying to look down the hallways, but it was very dark. Hit your light, Rogers said quietly. She pulled out her flashlight, scanning the area. Got it, he said, noting the office sign. He led them down the hallway, still waiting for the owners of the blood footprints to surprise them. As he reached the office door, he noticed a zombie wandering about. He motioned for Whitaker to turn off her flashlight to avoid alerting it. The lighting was dim, but the detective could see well enough to go inside and crack the unsuspecting ghoul on the back of the head. Whitaker followed him in and shut the door. The click of the latch was a lot louder than she'd thought it would be. Fuck, she hissed. Roger shook his head. Don't worry about it, just stand guard. He pulled out his own flashlight and worked his way to the back of the office, finding no other resistance. He stared down at the intercom system, which looked like it had been there since the 60s. There was a large metallic microphone attached to a long wire. He studied the control panel before finding the all speaker button. He flicked it on. Testing, testing, he said into it, and his voice boomed throughout the school. He glanced down at the speaker in the corner, and waved the microphone around in front of it. As he set the piece down, a deafening feedback squeal screeched throughout the building. That is a fucking horrific sound, Whitaker declared. Roger shrugged as he headed back over to her. Yeah, but it'll draw them over to the building, which is all that matters. So where to now, she asked. He inclined his head. Gotta get to the field door so they can start coming inside. Lead the way, she said and opened the door. Roger stepped through, and then grunted as a zombie grabbed him. He reacted quickly, pressing into the creature's chest, and Whitaker didn't miss a beat, immediately caving its skull in. 
As the ghoul crumpled to the floor, the detective raised a finger. I'm gonna make an executive decision and count that one as two points. Damn right you are, Whitaker said with a grin. Come on, let's get moving. I don't know how much longer I can handle that god-awful noise. They ran off down the hallway back towards the lobby, before turning towards the main corridor, towards the field doors. Whitaker held up the flashlight as the detective took batter duty. As they approached the back doors, there were a few zombies standing in their way. You need help? She asked. He shook his head. Nah, just keep the light on him. Gotta go earn that dessert. She shook her head as he stepped up and started cracking skulls. He dispatched the trio of zombies in record time with finesse. Forget the fire, Whitaker said, impressed. With you swinging like that, you should be able to clear them all out in short order. Rogers grinned. Amazing what men can do when properly motivated, huh? He reached the doors, and he peered through the tiny sliver between them. This is gonna be dangerous as hell, he murmured. How do you wanna do it? She asked quietly. He took a deep breath. We're gonna have to push one of them open so they can get a grip on it and slide through, he said. With any luck, they'll be able to open it up completely. That sounds exceedingly dangerous. Whitaker pursed her lips. Rogers shrugged. Unless you have a grenade on you, I'm not sure what else we can do. She tapped on the hinges, noting the hollow ping. Doesn't look like they use the best materials, she mused. Might be able to shoot the hinges off. We'd still have the problem of opening the door, the detective pointed out. She shook her head. But this way there's a better chance of it getting free of the frame. Good enough for me, Rogers replied with a shrug. You want to do the honors? Whitaker waved for him to follow her. We might want to take cover first. She led them to a nearby classroom door, setting up just behind it. She handed him her flashlight. Shine it on the hinges and I'll do the rest. The detective nodded and did so. As the light shone on the top hinge, she took aim and fired a three round burst. The bullets ripped through the metal, breaking it away from the frame. Hell yeah, one more, Rogers declared. Whitaker shot out the other one and then pointed. All right, you're up. Me? He raised an eyebrow. I thought we were doing this together. She winked at him. That's what you get for thinking. He chuckled and moved towards the door. He pushed on the hinge side, confirming that it was free from the door frame. He reached out for the release and paused. He took a step back and reached out with his bat, pressing it against the release. He looked back over his shoulder, and Whitaker nodded that she was ready to go. Rogers took a deep breath and pushed the release hard, opening the door just enough for zombies to get their hands inside. As soon as they pulled the door open, the detective turned tail and ran. Soon it was open wide enough for a zombie to get through, and then two. He joined Whitaker, and they watched as the creature struggled with the doors, but eventually got it out of the way of the frame. Within moments, dozens of zombies poured into the school. The duo headed for the front door, and Rogers pulled out his radio. Leon, it's Rogers. Status, came the reply. The detective followed Whitaker into the main hall. Door is breached, and zombies are pouring in. Let Mathis know we're gonna move soon. I'll tell him to get to the rally point, Leon replied. I'll also let the bus teams know to move. Rogers nodded. We'll let you know when we're safe. Copy that, Leon replied. Rogers put the radio away, and the duo grabbed their flamethrowers, backing up into the street. You do realize we're about to live out every middle school kid's fantasy, right? The detective asked. Whitaker shook her head. Not me. You never wanted to burn down the school at that age? Rogers raised an eyebrow. She grinned. Nah, I was always more of an explosives kind of girl. Woman after my own heart, he chuckled. She pulled out a lighter and set their steel wool on fire. Shall we? We shall, he nodded. They unleashed a torrent of flame towards the oncoming zombies. The flames grew hot as the horde became a mass of fiery flesh inside the lobby. As the fire raged, the duo turned and jogged off to the rally point behind the elementary school. They didn't get too far before they heard Mathis jumping down off of the building onto the air conditioning unit he'd tried to use to get up there. 
He ran over to them, glancing back at the school, quickly going up in flames. Goddamn, you two don't mess around, do you? The sniper asked as he reached them. Whitaker grinned. You know me, she replied. If I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do it big. Oh, I know, he rolled his eyes. I've been in many a firefight as a result. Rogers smirked. Those sound like some fun stories. Fun is certainly one word for it, Mathis replied dryly as they headed off to wait for their ride. Chapter 14 A few blocks from the high school, four buses sat alongside Hammond's truck. Okay, let's go over the plan one more time, the sergeant said. Once we get the signal, Clara is gonna lead this parade to the high school. Pick a point about 20 yards from the building, or closer if possible, and drive on up. Once you get situated, use the escape hatch to get on top and light those fuckers up. I'll be on pickoff duty if any of those flaming fucks gets around you. When the flames hit the buses, hop down into the truck bed, and we'll be off to drink to our victory. Any questions? Trenton raised a hand. Yeah, why do you get to drive the truck and we have to jump off the back of a bus? Because I hotwired this bitch, Hammond replied. Finders keepers and whatnot. A laugh rippled across the group at the childlike logic. Immediately after, the horrific feedback squeal came from the middle school. Mother of God, that's horrible, Clara said, wincing. Hammond poked at one of his ears. Sounds like my hearing after going to an Iron Maiden show. You know, Sarge, you really should use earplugs when you go to those shows, Landry suggested. Hammond scoffed. And I loot Maiden? Hell no. Now come on, let's roll out. Everyone manned their vehicles and started them up. Clara popped hers into gear and began to rumble down the street towards the high school. As she made the turn onto the side street that led to the field, she saw the massive horde shifting towards the high-pitched noise. As she got close to the end of the road, she slammed on the gas to rumble across the grassy field. There were still a few zombie stragglers towards the back of the pack, and she slammed into them at full speed. A few of them disintegrated on impact, leaving a fine, crimson mist sprinkled with bone. A few others went flying through the air, eventually landing on top of the horde, like a crowd surfer at a concert. Clara reached the end of the field and slammed on the brakes. There were still a few zombies ahead of her, but she knew that Hammond would take care of them. She grabbed her flamethrower and moved towards the back emergency hatch in the roof. As she moved, she had to brace herself as the bus behind her gave her a light tap on the bumper. Jesus, Trenton, calm down there, she muttered, and glanced through the back window to see him giving an apologetic wave. She shook her head and moved beneath the hatch, standing on the seats to reach it and pop it open. As she pulled herself up on top, she looked out over the sea of zombies, some clamoring for her, while others continued the push towards the middle school. The building in question started to smoke, and she lit up her own flamethrower in solidarity. She looked around at her teammates, already with smoldering steel wool. Clara raised her hand. Light em up, boys, she cried, and the quartet sprayed streams of liquid fire over the massive horde. They aimed up to try to get as much reach as possible, and the flames spread quickly, catching clothes and melting flesh. Grass singed and curled, and soon smoke filled the air, obstructing their view of the battlefield. Hair melted, flesh bubbled, and the stench was almost as horrendous as the shrieking feedback noise as the flames reached the line of buses. One by one, the four of them hopped back down into the waiting truck bed behind them, exchanging high fives. Holy shit, that actually worked, Trenton declared. Landry whooped. Not to mention it was a hell of a lot of fun, too. They laughed as the truck pulled up to the pickup point. The only one still stoic was Reed, as he stared at the flaming mass. He felt pride in having helped secure the town, but the throbbing pain in his side reminded him of the price he'd paid to do it. Chapter 15 Ethel passed out cups of hot coffee, and the group took the steaming mugs happily. I gotta say, that went a hell of a lot better than I expected, Hammond admitted. Most of the city is still standing, and we're here having a cup of joe while those fuckers smolder. Good day all around. 
The group raised their mugs and let out a cheer, save for Landry's trio. The sergeant clapped his private on the shoulder. Goddamn, Landry, lighten up, Hammond said. You don't have to be salty just because you had to do the most running today. His friend gazed at the floor. Yeah, you know me, Sarge. Not a fan of the cardio. We're up. Leon spoke up as the satellite computer clicked on. Let's see how things are looking. He pulled up the imagery around the high school. It was a smoldering mess, with the zombie horde a motionless mass instead of a writhing ball. The middle school was still smoking, but it hadn't spread anywhere else. The buses were complete wrecks, but they'd done their job. Doesn't look like much is still moving out there, Leon mused. He moved the camera around the area. Don't get too comfortable, though. Looks like we need to do a couple more sweeps before we can pull the survivors from the high school. Whitaker patted the detective on the shoulder. Slugger and I can handle that, no problem. Sarge here can handle the evacuation. Hammond downed the rest of his coffee in a single gulp. Well, let's get it done. I'm ready to start drinking to celebrate. He glanced at Landry, who didn't respond. Landry, Jesus, what is up with you? Not even going to get excited about drinking? Reed threw his hands up. Lay off him, he snapped. It's my fault he's acting like that. The room fell silent, everyone looking to the young man. He let out a deep sigh and then lifted his shirt, revealing his bite. Clara's hands flew to her mouth, a sob escaping her lips. Damn, man, Hammond stammered. Um, I'm sorry. Rogers and Leon opened their mouths at the same time, but Reed held up a hand to stop them. Nobody say another word about it, he demanded. I know how you all feel, and I appreciate the sympathies, but if I have to hear a constant stream of them, I will shoot myself in the head. I'd rather spend my time doing something productive, like getting those people out of the high school. There was a moment of silence, until Rogers took a deep breath. We'll honor your request, he agreed. Just know that if there's anything you want or need, just ask. There is one thing, Reed clasped his hands together. I know there's a good chance that I have a few days, but just to be safe, I want to be quarantined overnight. Leon, can you make sure I have a place to be locked up? The older man nodded. I'll take care of it, he promised. Reed picked up his gear and headed for the door. Nobody followed him, and he stopped at the door, turning around. Well, come on now, he said. Time is short, and those people aren't going to free themselves. End of book one. Coming soon, the plot to assassinate Tiago Rivas continues to take shape in El Paso, part five.